Hello, and welcome to Linux Action News, episode 281, recorded on February 21st, 2023. I'm Chris. And I'm Wes. Hello, Wes. Let's do the news. And we start with some news this week that you just love to see. The DreamWorks Animation Company is making their in-house renderer open source. Yeah, it's the rendering software behind the recent Puss in Boots, The Last Wish movie, How to Train Your Dragon, and others. It's called Moonray, and we first heard about plans to open source it back in August, but then, like most of these events, uh, everything just kind of went silent. Until this week, anyway, when DreamWorks gave us an update at the Open Source Forum 2023, put on by the Linux Foundation. They shared that they are pretty darn close to releasing the source code, and have launched an official documentation site. And it's a decent little site for what it is. I gave their docs a read-through. I wouldn't say there's anything too surprising. They're targeting a, quote, vanilla CentOS 7 machine. But they also have instructions for building Open Moonray in a Docker container. They are using the Apache 2.0 license for Open Moonray, and they expect it to be available on their website at openmoonray.org. So, what's DreamWorks' motivation for open-sourcing their in-production renderer? Well, we might get some insights into that thinking from Andrew Pierce, VP of Global Technology at DreamWorks, who said, quote, The appetite for rendering at scale grows each year, and Moonray is set to meet that need. We expect to see the code base grow stronger with community involvement as DreamWorks continues demonstrating our commitment to open source. Well, who doesn't like stronger code bases? I mean, to me, it sounds like they're expecting that folks in the industry and enthusiasts are going to just start contributing to Open Moonray and inevitably make it better. And that's probably a pretty safe bet. This is often where open source is at its best, when everyone involved is getting their particular itch scratched. And having powerful, credentialed software like this out there and available to us all, no doubt means that this tooling is going to end up being used in ways that just couldn't even dream of today. We don't cover every release of System D, but when we do, it's because there's something you should know about. And with version 253 released this week, well, it's definitely one of those releases. Yeah, and as always, the list of changes is long and many. But there's a change right at the top of the list that caught our attention. And that support for version 1 control groups is officially on the chopping block. In fact, the team says they intend to phase out support at the end of 2023. Yes, that's this year. They also warn most of us using software that still depends on version 1, writing, quote, If you run services that make explicit use of cgroup v1 features, i.e. the legacy hierarchy with separate hierarchies for each controller, Please implement compatibility with cgroup v2 sooner rather than later. Most of Linux user space has been ported over already. Okay, so here's what we're talking about. In Linux, you have this idea of a cgroup, which is short for a control group. It's a feature that allows for fine-grained resource allocation and management of system resources, such as your CPU, memory, and I.O. devices, among a group of processes. It's essentially a way to organize and manage processes and then control the resource usage. Cgroup v1 uses a hierarchical tree structure to organize processes and all their associated resources, with each cgroup having a single hierarchy of control knobs for resource management. That is in stark contrast to version 2, which uses a flat hierarchy to organize resources and also provides more fine-grained control over resource allocation. V2 also supports a unified hierarchy where all C groups are organized under a single tree, unlike V1, which has separate trees for different types of resources. And C group version 2 was first introduced in Linux 4.5, which was released back in March of 2016. But it's just taken the industry a long time. They've been slow to move, and the migration has some challenges, so you can understand why they've been hesitant. It seems though the SystemD team is going to do their part to just push things forward. So if your fiddly bits are still using C group version one, I guess consider this a heads up. You have a project on the horizon, but you do have plenty of time to get it done. 
with only three or four months left until the Debian 12 Bookworm release in some mirror near you, the development team is hard at work preparing the Debian installer with new features and fixes. And so far, the biggest change is the inclusion of non-free firmware by default. And, of course, the move to Linux kernel 6.1 LTS in the official images. Debian 12 Bookworm is currently in soft freeze and looking for testers, with the team ending their announcement this week with the following quote. We need your help to find bugs and further improve the installer. So please, try it. Installation images and everything else you'll need are available at our website. And we'll have that linked in the notes. Linode.com slash LAN. That's where you go right now to get $100 and 60-day credit on a new account. And it's a great way to support the show while you are checking out fast, reliable cloud hosting with the best support in the business. Real humans all day, every day. And the performance is absolutely top-notch. And the best part, really, is the pricing. 30 to 50% cheaper than the hyperscalers that want to lock you into their platforms and are always trying to upsell you. But I think on top of all of that, the thing that I appreciate the most is the approaches you have available to you when you sign up to Linode. It's really kind of amazing that they've struck this balance between the one-click type deployments or the burn it all down and build it up yourself approach. And I have done both. I really think it's a great way to try out things like NextCloud, or if you want to go play around with Terraform or Ansible in the cloud. And it's a fantastic way to deploy things that you might want to use for yourself personally with their nanodes or for your business with tens of thousands or millions of users. There's so many different things you could try. So that's why they give you the 100 bucks. So you can kind of hone in, kick the tires, and figure out what works for you. They got 11 data centers to choose from with another dozen coming online this year. And great features such as S3-compatible object storage, cloud firewall, backups, of course, and more. So go try it out. Go build something. Go learn something. See why so many in the Jupyter Broadcasting community just love using Linode and why they've stuck around. I think you'll be really impressed, and that 100 bucks will get you quite a ways. Linode.com slash LAN. Linode.com slash LAN. And thanks to Collide. Collide.com slash LAN. Our sponsor, Collide, has some big news. If you're an Okta user, they can get your entire fleet to 100% compliance. How? If a device isn't compliant, the user can't log in to your cloud applications until they've fixed the problem. It's that simple. Collide patches one of the major holes in Zero Trust architecture, device compliance. Without Collide, IT struggles to solve basic problems like keeping everyone's OS and browser up to date. Unsecured devices are logging into your company's applications because there's nothing there to stop them. Collide is the only device trust solution that enforces compliance as part of authentication. And it's built to work seamlessly with Okta. The moment Collide's agent detects a problem, it alerts the user and gives them instructions to fix it. If they don't fix the problem within a set time, they're blocked. Collide's method means fewer support tickets, less frustration, and most importantly, 100% fleet compliance. Visit collide.com slash LAN to learn more or to book a demo. That's K-O-L-I-D-E dot com slash LAN. We have been looking forward to the Linux 6.2 release for an embarrassingly long time. And this week, after kind of an extended development cycle, we finally got it. The most exciting thing, in my opinion, with Linux 6.2 is the Intel Arc graphics being promoted, finally, to stable. That's right. With 6.2, the Intel DG2 Arc graphics hardware will finally enjoy out-of-the-box support without any special overrides or having to add kernel module parameters on the command line. It has taken a bit to land fully, but I think that slower pace means Intel is pretty happy with where things are now. Yeah, I think I am too. It, it was usable. You could make it work previously, but now with, I think it's Mesa 22 and up and Linux 6.2 and up, you can just put an Arc GPU in your system and it will just work 
Kind of like how if you have Intel integrated graphics today and you install Linux, you get you get some basic 3D acceleration right out of the box. You didn't have to do anything. I remember when that first started happening, it felt like magic. This is now like that, but it's even better because it's a dedicated card with 256 megabytes of RAM or whichever one you might have. I, I'm using the A380 in this case. And the system is noticeably snappier because previously I was using busted NVIDIA graphics with LLVM doing the rendering. So it was really software rendering. And the interface on Plasma was fine. In fact, impressively, Plasma does really well in those conditions, but it wasn't great. And I slapped in that GPU, changed nothing else other than just having all of my software up to date because I do have a modified Ubuntu install where I put Linux 6.2 on there using the mainline installer tool. And I can notice it immediately. Just opening the menus, closing, minimizing, I can tell system of performance is better already. And it was no effort. There was no driver process I had to go install. There was no GUI I had to launch that searched for missing drivers and tried to load them and then build a module. None of that. It just works. And so that's my first impression, but I feel like there's a lot more testing to be done. So I'm going to just keep poking away at this thing, see what it's like to use on the daily, and I'll report back in a future episode of Linux Unplugged. Meanwhile, over on the open source NVIDIA side of the house, well, there's initial accelerated support for GeForce RTX 30 Ampere graphics cards, at least if you've got Linux 6.2 and Mesa 23 or above. But before you get too excited, keep in mind, it still performs poorly due to the lack of proper reclocking support. At least, Intel Nouveau can use the NVIDIA GPU system processor. Yeah, we'll get there. We'll get there. But it's nowhere near the ARC experience where it's at now with Linux 6.2. Also in 6.2, we have an improved XFAT and NTFS driver in there. Hardware monitoring for Asus motherboards is live and... I guess for better or for worse, even more improved support for Intel's software unlock CPU things. The feature list is impressive. And of course, improved Rust support and ButterFS performance and reliability improvements are near the top of that list. This release also adds support for user-defined BPF objects. This would let BPF program authors allocate their own objects in the kernel and then build their own object hierarchies and use those building blocks to build their own flexible data structures. Like, for example, you could implement a linked list all in BPF. Well, isn't that exciting? Uh, yeah, there's also that runtime verification tool that's landed. I want to dig a bit more into that. We'll link to the Kernel Newbies post on 6.2, and I really do encourage you to give that a scan, because 6.2 is a very impressive release, and nobody breaks it down like they do. And of course, with 6.2 out, the merge window for 6.3 has opened, and you know we'll be keeping an eye on that and everything else going on in the world of Linux and open source news. So don't miss a single episode. Go to linuxactionnews.com slash subscribe for all the ways to get each and every episode. And linuxactionnews.com slash contact to let us know what your favorite feature of Linux 6.2 is. And I know it's a long shot, but if you're in the Pacific Northwest area, Saturday, March 4th at 4 p.m., we're doing a little micro brewery meetup for Linux Unplugged episode 500. Again, Saturday, March 4th, 2023. Details are at meetup.com slash Jupiter Broadcasting. And whether you make it or not, don't fear. We'll be back right here next week with our take on the latest Linux and open source news. Thanks for joining us. That's all the news for this week. <laughs>